and, and I think it's important for us as leaders in robotics, right, to always, you know, never compromise from a safety perspective, right? Yeah. And that's why if you look at where we're focused, I go back to that controlled environments with skilled workers, because guess what? We, we can really reduce the chance of someone getting injured or hurt, right? And at the same time, help save lives or help reduce injuries. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jorgen Pedersen. He is the CEO and president of RE Squared Robotics. Uh, RE Squared's been doing a lot of really impressive stuff for quite a while now in Pittsburgh and all over the world. Jorgen, welcome to the pod. Uh, Spencer, thanks for having me. I uh, you know, look forward to it. Excellent. So I guess uh, a question I ask a lot of people that, that seems to be kind of a fun one is, how'd you get into the field of robotics? Uh, I think the... The seed was planted early uh, with Star Wars, um, reveal, nice. revealing my age in the in the seventies. Um, but you know, I was a great uh, movies. Uh, yeah, prequels are not as good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I I, I I I was fascinated by you know the, the robotics, the droids, the fact that they could help people, and I think that stuck with me. I didn't, I forgot about it for a while, but then it was. Then I think it was then the movie Top Gun came along and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a fighter pilot and, and uh, that's going to then uh, lead me into uh, becoming an astronaut because the right, the movie, the right stuff came out right after that. Well. And then I realized that I didn't have the eyes for either. And, you know, that probably wasn't my path. And then, but you're 18 years old at the time, graduating high school. And you're like, what's the next coolest thing? I was going to be uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs combined into one when I was that age. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's what uh, kind of set me uh, down the robotics uh, path. And then I got, I got into Carnegie Mellon and then I, went over to uh, what was called Building E, the Planetary Robotics Building. Oh, cool. And there was this big robot ambler. They, they had Nav Lab that could drive across the country. And I was just, and they had Dante that could walk into volcanoes. And I looked like, up to that robot so much as a kid. That was, yes. it was probably around the same time. I remember seeing that in the museum and just being so impressed and awestruck and it left a mark on me. Yeah. yeah. It, so that, that was it, right? Then I'm like, you know what? I think, I chose wisely this is really cool and uh i've been doing it ever since that's awesome yeah yeah uh, I, I think for me it was uh I, I had a cousin that was involved in in carnegie mellon and uh, his name's lee weiss yeah just retired but um an early age kind of brought me into nrac and i watched it was like a square being painted by a robotic i think it was an abb arm because i remember a lot of orange right and um I just remember thinking that was so cool. And then I saw Dante and I think Crusher uh, was like a little bit later, but still yes. sort of around this and all that stuff just left a mark. And I wanted, I wanted to work on stuff like that. So. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think we're both in a good space right now. I mean, the, there's been a, a transformation in the past decade and even more so even in the past few years. Of, oh yeah. Like a, just cultural acceptance of robotics and you know, the, the world is finally ready for robotics. 20 years ago when yeah. I started the business, it was not the case, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, we, we, we have patience apparently, and eventually the world woke up to the, to the same realization that what, we had. What do you think precipitated that? Cause I, I feel like there was a bunch of stuff, but I want to hear your opinion on it. I think it's a combination of things, but I think the pandemic actually really accelerated I agree. The, the need for robotics yeah, and also transformed the cultural view of robotics. Yeah. Um, everyone always thought the robot apocalypse is coming and we can't trust robots they are going to take our jobs. Yep. If there was any time the robots were going to take over the world is when the pandemic happened and no one could go anywhere. So, you, okay, robots, you go and do everything. Yeah. But the barista never showed up at Starbucks. And we're all still here and people are realizing, but wait, 
there are ways that they could be a, a useful tool. Now they can go and disinfect for us and they can go uh, perform dangerous tasks for us. And it's okay. And I think there was in the beginning of a cultural shift occurring yeah. at that point that we hadn't seen before. I don't know if you... you I, I, I observed the same thing, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as I mentioned, we had a guest on here a little bit ago, uh, Matt Sharuka from Vecna. Yeah. And he was saying that, you know, that was the first year that automotive was not the main consumer of robotics. Um, I haven't been following as close as I could, but I'd be really interested to see, because as you know, Vecna's in the warehouse logistics space. I'd be interested to see how the delivery space is doing, because I know that, um, you know, there were a bunch of entries into that uh, maybe a couple of years ago that might have been too soon. Right. I feel like now with, you know, I mean, you saw USPS and FedEx workers getting sick, unfortunately, with the Rona. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a better case than ever to, to roboticize some of those jobs, I think. Yeah. And in our in our case, we do intelligent mobile manipulation. Right. Yeah. And it took a while to mature that technology and get it to a level where we had the power density and the power efficiency and this, you know, this, you know the strength to weight ratio, the dexterity, the the ability to go outside, put all that in cool. one package. I mean, it, and we were lucky that, um, you know, the defense department was the early adopter and funded the lion's share of that. Um, you guys have done amazing training. with that business model, by the way. I just, I can't commend you enough on that. Yeah, well, you have to have a lot of patience, yeah. uh, but it was, uh, you know, over $75 million of non-dilutive investment is the way I look at it. That's awesome. Into the development of this core technology that both, the defense department can benefit from. Yeah. But now it became so real that when commercial customers started calling us, it was no longer a PowerPoint presentation. It, <laughs> it was, would you like a demonstration? And there was realness to it. There that's was awesome. believability to it. So I think that's what's accelerated on, you know, within our space is we now have a maturation level that brings confidence that it can solve problems in these commercial sectors as well. It's a powerful selling tool. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. one thing and you can always tell, I mean, who's built it and who hasn't when you look at the, the right. video. Yeah. One day the world will need this technology and we'll be there. You know, right. there's a rendering or like, no, here's a robot doing a thing. And yeah. furthermore, it's good at doing the thing, you know, and, and you know, we can, we can throw some challenges at. I mean, I think that's why those Boston Dynamics videos were so powerful. It's because they're throwing weights at these things, you know, and, and doing all sorts of things to try to break it. And it's, Yep. Fault tolerant. Yeah. And, and the, there's a natural understanding. The more human like it is, the more that, you know, people are comfortable with humans, right? right. So um, the big factory robots are scary and big. You know, they're, they're amazing at what they do, but they're intimidating. And so now. Um, I can see that. So now. It looks very alien. Yeah. And, you know, the. Industrial automation market it was just fine because it's a controlled environment, suctioned off. You can put whatever capability you yeah, want you in there. Want giant panic or ABB arms. Right. But now when you want to go out into the world, you want to be mobile, you want to uh, leave the factory floor and even go outside, now you need to be safe. You need, yeah. to, you need to have the same capability, but in a much more compact form. Yeah. Do you think a lot of that's psychology or it's actual safety or it's a combination of both? It's probably a combination of both. I can see yeah. that. Yeah. I think, um, I think the cultural, cultural acceptance comes from, uh, you know, something that looks an anthropomorphic. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I but, feel like there's the uncanny valley, so you don't want it to be yeah. so anthropomorphic that it's creepy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at the same time, uh, it needs to be safe, right? Yeah. And the the more compact it is, the less inertia. The inherently, the more safe it is, right? Yeah. I mean, so so it's it's it's. I, I think it's both. I saw one the other day, and I cannot remember the name of the company. Uh, might have been. I'm gonna get this wrong. I feel like it was Badger Technologies, maybe. Um, but it was an inventory robot, like like what Boston Nova was doing, and um, it was a dip drive. Uh, but what I remember about it is that it it definitely struck me as not dangerous in any way because it was very slow and you know it was a lot of like uh i don't want to say flimsy but like uh you know commercial grade injection molded panels per se right and um it, it didn't strike me as like it had the capability to hurt anyone but it was like eight feet tall 
Right. So I feel like there were some design constraints that were, you know, gone outside of for the sense of sensing. And that, that was interesting to me. I yeah. thought it was an interesting yeah. decision. And that's kind of the difference between the, the markets that we're looking at and, you know, the traditional industrial automation. Robots traditionally have been how fast and accurately can I move this part from here to there or, you know, perform this action. And which generated really large, bulky robots, which are dangerous to go around, yeah. to be around. Yeah, of course. Um, whereas we're doing more human-like, humans don't flail their arms around, you know, at Mach, you know, seven, to, you, know, <laughs> you know, play at the park. They are methodical, they're performing tasks, but it's not anything ridiculous in terms of speed. Yeah. It's more, and we're also not very accurate, right? Our, you know, what, you know, if you look at it, you try to hold your hand and you can't hold a, you know, sub millimeter uh, position. Oh yeah, no way. But we can perform really complex tasks like reaching out and grabbing that water right there yeah. because we are using our brain and our perception, right, to constantly close the loop on what we're doing and using tactile, right? So by introducing these other attributes, you can get smaller, more compact more human-like capability it doesn't have to be anthropomorphic but yeah. it, but it's just more uh you know compact and safe and and uh you know attractive right to that, be around than than the large robots that everyone's used to i would buy that uh, yeah can you say some of the things you're working on that are kind of along those lines uh yeah so we have several um, secretive developments. Obviously, uh, ironically, the most secret ones are with commercial customers because they don't <laughs> that they, they, they want to maintain their competitive edge and don't want to reveal the product until it's officially launched. That makes sense. Um, but I think one of the perfect, uh, our, one of our more recent examples is we are uh, doing automation of solar field construction. So there are big photovoltaic panels that get installed on racking systems. That's cool. It's a very uh, um, tiring job, right? I would imagine. You know, uh, it's prone to injury. It's prone to poor quality because people are getting fatigued. And the, the cool part of it is the people still are needed there to do fine adjustments and verify. Yeah. But the robot's taking on the bronze. Why do you have to rack a PV cell, if I can ask? Um, you know, that's what holds it. Uh, it, it, it gets uh, placed on this bar that's then tracks the sun. Oh, got it. Right. Okay. Um, and, you know, the human's still there and they can perform the fine nuances of installation, make sure everything's right, Hair, handle the, the edge cases and, and deal with errors. So, so they, they, it's not like anyone's losing their job, right? Yeah. But you're accelerating. Right. Yeah. When I could, like, I would assume you could run that facility leaner. I mean, more yeah. efficiently. Yeah, and now you can build a solar farm in half the time. And if some, a lot of these solar farms take three years to build. Wow. So if you can build it in a year and a half, now you're able to transform from more traditional energy sources to renewables that much. And faster. you can move all that equipment somewhere else and build another one. And you can move and build and accelerate the adoption of renewables. That's you're awesome. keeping people safe. No one's losing their job, but uh, you're saving uh, energy. You're saving cost and in installation, and those savings get passed on to customers. So it's a win-win-win-win-win all the way around. That's really cool. You know, it, it's like a perfect uh, example of how robotics can really help people in a positive that way. That's awesome, by the way. Yeah. I know you did put up a YouTube video and I, I watched it briefly, but can you remind me, was that a two handed manipulation? Like yeah. Kind of stuff you've been working on? So, our defense work, you know, really culminated with this two arm, it was fairly anthropomorphic, yeah. you know, solution. Uh, which the way that was controlled was really novel too. You had a miniature version. That... Yeah, it was what we call our imitative controller. That is a scale model of the the device you're controlling, and it Super can be cool. worn. Yeah. It could be on a desktop. It doesn't matter. Uh, and even we, like on a lanyard. Yeah, like yeah. on a lanyard, and we use it even for our underwater variant. Nice, uh, right? And and they're actually out at San Diego doing testing right now, where there's a guy on a boat wearing this device That's controlling awesome. a robot underwater. Um, and 
it matches your motions. How deep could that thing go again, by the way? I remember being really impressed by the figure. I, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of meters. <laughs> yes. That's so cool. Yes. Um, must have taken some doing and <laughs> catastrophic failures along the way. Yeah, actually, we, uh, I, I was really impressed with our engineering team. They, they really didn't blow things up along the way. They just, uh, actually, they just got it right. That's impressive. Uh, it, it really so impressive. Really good tolerances, it, mirror finishes, it, yeah. the right gaskets. Yes, you know. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Um, but but that imitative controller, what's great about it is um, it's highly intuitive because first of all, you're controlling a two arm system. Humans are naturally very familiar with that. Yeah. Um, and we measure intuitiveness in two ways. One is training time. It takes one minute to train something. That's it. <laughs> that's cool. Then it's uh, time to proficiency. And it's about uh, maybe a couple hours. How do you define proficiency? Um, you're able to uh, pick up, a, you know, a glass and do something with it. Uh, you know, so you just so set up a task. And then you set up a task, you task and, and you're able to perform a complex task that requires multiple degrees of freedom. Right. Okay. It is somewhat subjective, right? Yeah. But, you know, a novice could be trained on this and be performing fairly complex task with a two arm system, you know, in really very cool. short order. Right. So that, that sets the foundation for now our next generation of, of technology, which is called the Sapien. So yeah. RE2 Sapiens are new. I've uh, been seeing line. a lot of buzz on that on LinkedIn. Yeah, we you know, and it's serving multiple markets. You're gonna see it in energy, you're gonna see it in aviation, it's gonna be in there was defense. a welding example that I keep seeing pictures of which looked pretty you, interesting. You'll see it in construction. Yeah. Yes, definitely construction. Um, anything where you need to work at height. I mean, so our, our mission is uh, helping people do their jobs safely and efficiently, right? Yeah. That's what we're about, right? So if you look at all the applications where that can occur, construction is another perfect example. If you're looking at power electronics at all, like like line work, I feel like that's it, one where it could we, come We out. have looked at that. Um, we don't have traction there yet, but we have looked at that. I know where you can yeah. <laughs> have it all in one day. Um, you know, but construct, anything working at height, yeah, like, you, know, you know, what you're alluding to, right, is working at height is dangerous, right? Yeah. So if you can get the, even if you can get the person out of the bucket and on the ground, yeah, then you can well, really... Well, really good, like, three <coughs> camera systems now, too. I feel like you could have pretty good situational awareness, even remotely, on that task. I saw the other day, I was driving down the highway, and I remember um, <coughs> there were four... Uh, not scissor lifts, but like boom arm lifts, and they were holding corners of a net. And then there was a person with, you know, like two safety harnesses, and they were walking along a high tension line, and they were outside of the uh, the square of the. It's like this. There's got to be a better way to do that task. I mean, that's. I guess that's what yeah. brought that to mind. And I mean, I've done enough with the power electronics industry and adjacent to it that I've kind of seen some other crazy examples of just just the amount of danger and that. I mean, people get vaporized. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so. Yeah. It, any any task that's dangerous right that's really where we um you know that that's our number one focus like our our vision is a safer world through robotics that's right? cool um now the bit usually need a more uh efficient right to help drive the business case sometimes. yeah of course if you do it way slower than a person nobody's gonna buy it right so you gotta you gotta hit both you can but you can achieve both uh and that's what we're that's what we're focused on Excuse me one second. No problem. <coughs> Got a tickle in my throat. <laughs> All good. It's not the Rona, both fully vaccinated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> um, and uh, where was I going to go with that? You were saying a safer world. Yeah, uh, safer uh, world. Tech, if you can hit human uh, speed, that's a necessity. Uh, and then you can drive more adoption. Absolutely. And there's a common thread in all the applications where we're getting traction. And this traction is coming by strong market pull. It's not like we're creating a technology and hoping people buy it, right? We are being sought saying, we need this general manipulation capability. And here's our problem that I know you can solve. Nice. Right? Um, and and what I, I noticed the other day that there's a, a common thread across all of them. They are controlled environments with skilled workers interesting so whether it's in an or whether it's 
uh, out on an airport, whether it's out on a construction site, um, whether it's in, in uh, a pier, right? They're usually controlled environments and the people that are operating in those environments are usually skilled workers, right? Yeah, so that seems to be a, a key aspect for getting the the pull. The That's adoption. interesting. Because the likelihood of someone getting hurt is is lower. They may be dangerous jobs, but the, the fact that you're on a construction site, people are trained at their jobs, yeah, right, already. Now you're just getting that person who's trained at working up in a bucket down on the ground. You are improving safety, but not adding danger in the process, you know, because, yeah. you know, so. And maybe efficiency, I would hope too. It sounds like. It yeah, exactly. Example. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if these arms are already in a bucket on a lift, right. Um, you don't need to bring it down, put a person on, have them put PPE on. Well, at least in the pictures, yeah. that looked like there was still a man carrying area on that lift. So, yeah, and that's just because they're still there. You could yeah. use it in either manner. That's really cool. Um, but eventually, you may not even need that bucket up there. It's yeah. just a boom with manipulation capability. That makes a lot of sense. And right. I, mean, I mean, having worked in mining briefly, I'm sure you know there's just regulations where you probably need a person to be right there inspecting it or. Yep. adjacent and you know that's what you're working around exactly yeah so inspection uh welding performing complex tasks you know anything that you need human uh, yeah, uh dexterity but also human intellect to yeah. do that it can be either teleoperated right that's like the the short putt yeah but then there's certain things that can be um you know, semi-autonomous. I don't really view the world as fully autonomous, right? I always think everything is supervised autonomy. But there's still a human there. Maybe this one human is overseeing four robots. And they're right. just there to handle the errors, right? You yeah. Know, like, oh, this one was welding um, and, you know, some error happened. What's going on? Yeah, you tracking know? errors are common in that area. I've seen. Yeah. So then the person comes in who's probably an expert in that domain. Right. Yeah. It says, let me share my expertise. You could have a certified welding engineer, you know, and it would be economical. Right. And and this is the other part that I think the world is missing is there are huge labor shortages across the board. I think there was 200,000 unfilled construction jobs. Wow. Last year. Right. Um, people, you can't find the talent to We're do We're seeing these. it now in some of the manufacturing that our clients need. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but there's people that just aren't there to, to fill orders, you know, at the speed, you know, that, that industry wants right now. That's right. Um, that's, that's why, you know, I have confidence in that, you know, robots are here to augment, you know, humans, not replace them. Right? Yeah. We're here to help us move forward. Right. Yeah. So. That makes sense. I mean, I could see how that would lead to like a better life for everybody. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I can also see that the, the horror scenario as people talk about too in an alternative universe but i, I think that's probably just a fairy tale yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well let's hope so <laughs> yeah, I, I agree <laughs> yeah but uh, man i think i think we have enough good robots too like that would be another interesting one is if that did happen you know designing the robots to take out the bad ones would be kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> again yeah. more of a fairy tale than anything else but you know, yeah philosophy cool yeah, yeah. so um I guess uh, that, that gives me kind of a good overview. I'm trying to think of where to go next. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what's what's cool about you know the RE2 Sapien line is you know we've we've kind of defined a standard now. Okay. For what an outdoor mobile manipulator should be, right? You yeah. Know, in terms of strength to weight ratio, you got to run off of a standard DC battery. You, um, What's the voltage your systems are running at? Uh, it, in the weeds, it, 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 it depends on the size. We have some that runs up, run off of 24, some run off of 48, some run off of 96 volts. Does that get influenced by the industry as well, or is that more just how much copper you want to run through those? Yeah, it's, it's usually just based on the size, right? Exactly. And, you know, just you know, matching, uh, you know, wire diameter, yeah. right? To the cross sectional area, the higher the voltage, the less light you need. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the sapien arms are really defining what outdoor mobile manipulation should look like, 
right? And yeah. you can't simply port an industrial arm to this application, right? Yeah. You have to think about it from the ground up that this is going outside. What kinds of things have you done that are kind of new to the robot arm space in order to solve those problems? Yeah, some of it's proprietary. You know, I can't reveal the secret sauce. But, you know, in general, we looked at, um, you know, what most people do is they take an off-the-shelf motor and an off-the-shelf, uh, you know, gearbox and an off-the-shelf motor controller, and then they package them together and then house them, and that gets big really yeah. fast. But if you go a couple layers down in terms of, you know, the commercial off-the-shelf components, and you're just buying motor windings and you're just buying the innards of some gears and you're just buying or you're making your own custom motor controllers yeah now you can optimize the design and get it more compact right nice. and then as you're optimizing it you can start thinking about well, what makes things fail overheating well what if we really control the heat dissipation nice. as we're optimizing this design right now you can really start to get some premium output using still COTS components, right? It's just you're packaging it and doing intelligent engineering along the way. That's interesting. So I can think of a few ways you would do that. And again, stop me if this is overreaching, yeah. but I'm, I'm yeah. interested in having these conversations. So would that be, you know, like adding more aluminum or other materials that sink heat away, limiting exactly. current to the motors, combination of both? Exactly. Running and water and hydraulic fluid nearby. Yeah, I mean, we don't do the water unless it's our underwater arms, but uh, but yeah, it's it's sinking that heat outward, right? And it's using software to monitor and keep a track of temperature. Nice. Rather than shutting things down, you just slow things down. That's right? cool. So you don't have right. any kind of failure, even a stoppage. Yeah, it's like graceful degradation. It's like, well, I, I can't lift, you know, full capacity right now, but yeah. I, can, I can still lift half. While I'm waiting for things to kind of cool back down, like a person, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's it's more human like, right? Yeah. Um, and then you uh, you factor in the AI, which is our RE2 intellect, and the perception, which is our RE2 detect. Yeah, you've right? been bringing in some really clever AI and, and algorithms people, so I'd be interested to know as much as you're allowed to say. Yeah, well, uh, luckily, uh, they're way smarter than I am, and uh, I don't know if I could even, <laughs> I could even you know, regurgitate what they would uh, tell me. But, uh, you know, if you start thinking like a human, right, and start perceiving mm -hmm. like a human, and we don't, you know, the key that we found to work outside is to be multimodal, right? In terms, in terms of your sensing, don't rely on just one sensor. Got it. Okay. Just like a human doesn't rely solely on. Yeah, is are our eyes dominant? Yeah, but we use our ears. We yeah, use everything feel. seems fine, but I'm hearing this weird grinding sound. What is that? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, or if you're driving in a car, boy, are you using what your this you know the forces you're feeling? Yeah, the semicircular canals probably. Yeah. Yeah back of a seat against you if you hit the accelerator real hard. Yep, so multimodal is really important to getting increased reliability out, outside. And then even the algorithms for interpreting that that perception uh, is critical, right? You, you want to have maybe three or four algorithms oh, interesting. running in parallel, That's all cool. processing the same data set. Do you have a voting so, system that deals with that? Yeah, so you, well, I, I, I don't know if I can speak to that. No uh, worries. But, but yes, you're fusing it, some, you know, and how that's done, you, you got to bring in someone uh, smarter than me. But you, you, but I know that they're fusing this information such that you're, you know, this algorithm saying, hey, this is 90% uh, confidence that we're grasping this uh, photovoltaics panel the correct way. And this one's yeah. saying 99%, this one's saying 97 and this one's saying 95%. It's pretty high confidence looking at the now if we had gone with just that first one at the 90 we, yeah. may, well, we may have yeah. wanted to try to put it down and reseat and grab again right but now you but, saved the whole iteration cycle because right. you've got those other perspectives exactly and it's all probabilities and confidence right yeah because nothing is you know concrete you know it and, seems like that's what a lot of ai is when you get and I, it's not that i'm an ai expert but i've had a lot of people on that know more about it than me 
Yeah. yeah. People like I'm getting exposed a little, and then we we have an AI branch at SKA now as well, and so those people are smarter than me, and I yeah pick up little teeny bits and pieces like enough to know the buzzwords. Yeah. You you want to talk to you know Dr. Amanda Segroy at RE Squared who's leading up all our time. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, she she could have a much more in-depth conversation on, uh, on that. But I she know- She wants it's, to come on. I would, I would love to have her on. Yeah, I'll, I'll let her know. Thanks. Um, but the, uh, it's that fusion and, and just, it's a confidence level because humans, I, you know, you, you can't say with certainty that, you know, that's exactly that, or I can, gra you know, if I'm grabbing this, if I go like this, I'm gonna grab it perfectly. You're adapting on the fly, but, and you're basing off of, the the confidence levels that you have but at no point am i 100 percent confident that i am going to grab this glass perfectly you've all broken time. glasses right or knock something over right yeah. robots are no different and when, now society places them at a higher standard it seems and when it comes to yeah, safety I've that too. When, when it comes to safety like you know self-driving cars and so we got to take that very seriously because yeah we can't have robots cause harm, but if they're, you know, so that goes back to those. But to, to, to say it's going to cause zero harm and you're going to also have max adoption, I feel like might be a fallacy as well. Because I mean, if you have, you know, a billion units out on the street, I mean, it's not unforeseeable that one of them might not function at some point in some way, you know, just given the laws of statistics, I mean. Yeah. And, you know, so then it comes down to, well, what's your, you know, how do you gracefully fail to minimize the chance of yeah. someone actually getting hurt? Well, I agree. I think that's that's yeah. responsible engineering and you know, good citizenship. Yeah. And, and I think it's important for us as leaders in robotics, right, to always, you know, never compromise from a safety perspective, right? Yeah. And that's why if you look at where we're focused, I go back to that controlled environments with skilled workers, because guess what? We, we can really reduce the chance of someone getting injured or hurt, right? And at the same time, help save lives or help reduce injuries. Can you talk about people. some of those failure modes you've designed in? Or is that, again, edging into the secret sauce too far? Um, no, I mean, the I, I, I spoke to the temperature. Yeah, that's a good cool one. So the slowing it down, I, I, I'm really interested in that. That's right. But sensing about you and also slowing down if if you get the not you know even an inkling that someone's coming near you nice. right you, you better start slowing things down right so you don't go to a full stop at, to a certain point there's probably a proximity right. level where you do yes but then no that's that's really interesting and that's also does that i mean i, I would assume so just from a, the work i've done in industrial automation but in your experience, does that serve as a visu uh, visual indicator to the people nearby that, hey, maybe they're getting too close to the robot? Does that help at all? Yeah, I, I think that it it is natural, you know. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good, uh, you know, analogy to, uh, to you know, it, like if you saw someone swinging a baseball bat up yeah. at home, like, you, you know, that's an indication to you, just don't go over there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, like, or... Yeah. You know, wait till he, you know, comes and puts the bat down at his side. Then it's okay to approach and talk yeah, to someone. Yeah, it can be the most level-headed, controlled person in the world, but you wouldn't want to run right. up and put your head right. in the pitcher's mouth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not the pitcher's mouth, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, it, it's some of those cues that, you know, because that's what a human would, like, if, if I, you know, were, you know, throwing bags of mulch i don't know yeah. just contriving stuff here if you're in a butcher shop and you know you're cutting you know down a roast on a bandsaw you right know, you know and just you know lugging and, I, it around. and i saw someone coming up i would stop right yeah. or even if you're mowing your lawn right and you know there's a, a kid walking down the street you may pause and wait right yep. until they went by right it's these that's very you're driving human. your car yeah yeah it's very human-like, right, to, yeah. to recognize, oh, I need to not cause harm to those around me. Yeah. Robots should have that exact same behavior, yeah, right? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, which doesn't mean you shut down, you know. It's not like, oh, I hit the e-stop on the guy mowing the lawn, right? Yeah. You know, oh, they just slow down, make sure, <laughs> okay, they're going that way. Okay, it's good for me to resume, right? Yeah. So it's the same type of attributes and behaviors that we need to see in robots, too. 
And those are those social cues. Yeah, it's right? a good design philosophy. I really yeah. like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, it, it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, I, I'm not a self-driving car expert. It'll be interesting to see how those come about because, you know, I, I, I can almost conjecture that the way robots drive, way different than the way that humans drive right I'm now. sure yeah you know so hot so is it just as important of that interaction you know I was just using that as an example yeah um, it you know is defining the way that humans and robots interact in each application whether it's self-driving cars whether it's working in a construction site or it's working you know um, you know in an operating room yeah the you know these are the these interactions need to be defined. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So does that look like just a big flow chart? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people thinking through this in a lot of different ways, but how yeah, do you derive it, some of those, some of those hierarchies, some of those rules? Yeah. And that, that's part of our AI is helping to define these, you know, state diagrams, right? Of yeah. How you maneuver in thought, um, cool. based on what you're perceiving. Um, and, and then if making it be a fluid state diagram, you know, that's what that, you can have a fluid state uh, diagram. Doesn't yeah, that's yeah. not even a state anymore. Uh, yeah. So that's interesting. can you create new states? Cause I bet you that's what humans do. You know? Yeah, sure. So, so you that's, know, that you're doing you that learn. right now. I don't know. You okay, gotta, that's, that's where you have to ask Amanda, but, uh, you know, that, really that was just, that. that was just me, you know, uh, thinking about how we can even improve beyond yeah, you know, what, because most robots now are just program fits within, you know, constraints. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's all rules based. It's all rules based and AI with learning gives you some flexibility, but what I can't speak to, and it'd be interesting to speak to an expert about, yeah. you know, is, well, can you go outside that box and come back in? Right. Yeah, you know, and can you redefine, you know, state diagrams? That's that's an interesting. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that either. I'd yeah. be really interested to find out as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to you want to talk about? You want to plug? I feel like um, I've just really enjoyed hearing about some of the universal lessons you've learned in, in building these machines. Yeah, I've really enjoyed hearing about how that impacts people. I mean, there's there's so much to go through here. I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours about this stuff. Yeah, I mean. Uh, it's exciting. Robot. The time of robotics is now. Um, yeah. You know, when I started RE Squared, there was I think maybe six robotics companies in Pittsburgh. Now there's over a hundred. Wow. Right. And we're going to be twenty years old. Congratulations. Next month. Yeah. So next month, uh, be twenty years old. That's incredible. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Um, and you know, we were a little ahead of our time. You know, we yeah. we, we saw the vision of how I assume you would have had to be to survive twenty years of the business. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 it's it's exciting that the world is finally ready and aware for these uh, robotics. We're growing significantly. Um, you know, so I guess the only plug I would put in is like we're constantly looking to hire yeah. uh, talented engineers in all domains: software, electrical, mechanical, project managers. Uh, and we're we're going to and we're also looking for product managers uh, as well because the company's gone from it, it's transformed over time. Yeah, it went from being almost an extension of Carnegie Mellon University in the early years. Makes sense. To hey, we got an SBIR in two thousand five, and it was focused on mobile manipulation, and that kind of set our path. We became a that was the the uh, explosive disarming. Right. Yeah. Bomb, yeah. you know, helping bomb squads stay away from threats and make them safe. Cool. Uh, and, and then from that time until 2010, we were a government R and D contractor solving those hard problems. And then 2010, that's when we started shipping product. Nice to right. the civilian sector as well. Yes. And, cool. uh, most some of, of it, the first things you shipped like to the private sector, if I can ask. Um, obviously again, to the extent you're allowed to talk about them. Well, here's the thing is we, we, uh, we oftentimes don't know where they go. Interesting. Right. Because we, because we created partnerships, you know, f for example, um, well, the, you know, when we sold 181 arms to Northrop Grumman, 
we knew that it was going to the Air Force for explosive ordnance disposal to keep people safe away from traffic. Yeah, right? nice. So we knew exactly where that was going. But once it was there, we don't know where in the world they were going, right? We just Probably knew. everywhere. We yeah. just sold 180. Yeah. Um, but we also incredible. sold um, a small robot arm to, um, at the time, it was iRobot. They had the iRobot Defense, and eventually it became, uh, you know. Uh, it was. Uh... The heck just... Endeavor, then yeah. now FLIR systems. FLIR, that's right. And now yeah. they were bought again. Wait, uh, actually? Yes. And who's the latest act acquiring? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Teledyne. Right? Okay, yeah. I did not know that. Yes. Thank you. So um, when we sell the robotic arm on, you know, with that platform, which is the first look, right, um, it goes out into the world and they sell to both civilian as well as, you know, defense. So not sure where it's going it, it could be i don't know i don't know the ratio of defense um, can i ask if you license those designs ever or you just always sell product outright we've done both in the early yeah. years we license but now we're more of a manufacturer cool. so we do it ourselves we're building up our manufacturing capability especially we're going into the medical market so we need to very be, nice that's one of my favorite markets we need we need to be a, a manufacturer of the um uh the device you know a component of the system that's going out into the field yeah. so we're getting our iso uh 13485 certification to be a, a, a manufacturer of that type of technology um and that's all in-house that you're doing that right yeah so we're super we, cool we do we manufacture our robotic arms right here, here in downtown lawrenceville in pittsburgh pennsylvania you know we're manufacturing right here in the city nice um we, we have in the past for you know uh gone to contract manufacturers yeah. but right now we're organically building up that capability I mean, and i'm sure you still would for like a you know several off assignment that's a little bit outside but yeah it makes sense i mean given what you're, you're doing and the kinds of numbers we're talking about here yeah so so since 2010 we've been shipping these products um but then 2018 that's when we really pivoted and focused on commercial and now we're two-thirds commercial oh wow and, and one-third defense um whereas a year earlier from that we were almost all defense right That's they were the early adopter so we pivoted really quickly in one year um and and defense is still growing yeah right so it's not like that waned that's awesome. but commercials pulling us much faster that's right? incredible because the time of robotics to solve world problems is now right were there were there any kind of lessons you had to learn quickly to to sort of succeed in that endeavor or? uh hire people focused on it nice <laughs> uh you know uh and uh you know just expand your horizon right yeah um, and you know we and and Honestly, there was just a little bit of luck. We I would bump, yeah, bump into is. a specific person at a conference who had a specific need, and we just so happened to have exactly what they needed, right? Um, awesome. You know, so the, there is luck that comes into play, but um, I think more it's recognition that if you want to focus on something, you have to hire people to focus on that. Yeah, right? and the best people I would think are people that have done that before, or at least something as similar as you can get exactly yeah so so that's that's uh so all this growth yeah we're hiring that's you know uh you know we look forward already to... squared once you yeah <laughs> uh so we're uh yeah we're excited about the future um at, you know having tremendous growth you know we expect to grow by 75 percent this year nice um you know we even grew by 15 percent during covid so. now are you uh are you vested at all or are you entirely privately held at this point we are uh, privately held. Nice. So, yeah. We, Live in the dream. That's awesome. Yeah, privately held. We do have some investors, but, yeah. you know, we're still a private company. And, um, you know, just look forward. You know, just have, or we bootstrapped the business, you know, I put $1,000 in the bank in 2001. And, you know, we just built off of that and uh, built That's up. incredible. Um, and, and I think a lot of our perseverance has been having a mindset of always take care of the customer They're, yeah right always come through we've we've taken a loss on certain things in the past we've had that happen as well on on purpose for the fact of ensuring follow-on business and reputation yeah so reputation is really powerful 
especially with robotics. So uh, we're very careful to, to, you know. That makes a lot of sense. And at least for me, I think a lot of the core philosophy is just treating people like you want to be treated. So, yeah. you know, if the situation were reversed, you know, and you had this promise made to you, you know, like you'd want to see things right come through, you know, no matter what the, the circumstance. So I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah. Yep. So that's, uh, it, you would think that, you know, most people would follow that, but it's not always obvious. Yeah, know? I agree. Um, so, and the other thing that I think helped accelerate our growth too, and I don't, I, I don't ever underestimate this. There's been a, a cultural mind, mind shift, right? Yeah. That I put together uh, new core values for the business. And I focused on that. And that drives the business now. Can you say what some of those are? are yeah, I get it. I don't need to cut you off when you're no, about to. No, yeah, yeah. Trust, respect, integrity, positivity. Those are core values. Those then are we, good core values. And then we have guiding principles that overlay on that, right? Um, we're trying to uh, make a positive impact in the world. We're trying to, we want to empower our team. Cool. Right. Um, and we want to innovate through robotics, right? These are the, the principles that lay lay on top of it, right? And and then the most important guiding principle is really people first. Nice. Ever since we set those core values and we made it that um, let's focus more on making the best work environment for our people. So you're actively weighing decisions against those core values and guiding principles to make sure they're congruent. Yes. That's cool. Yeah, and we hire against them. We nice. have a process built around it to make sure that whoever we hire and bring in align with those core values. That's great. Just, it's half of the interview is that, not, and then all, the other half is technical. That makes a lot of sense. Right. It, it's almost easier to find really technically, you know, competent people. I know but, the feeling. <laughs> right. But finding those that align and share your values and are buy into our vision of a safer world through robotics are positive, kind, compassionate people, right? Absolutely. Um, by doing that, what I found is innovation comes, profitability comes, growth comes, technical sex, success comes. That's awesome. And I would imagine just having everybody playing for the same team to that extent, just, right. I mean, I know synergy is a cheesy word because the nineties, but uh, yeah. I would assume it's there, you know? So yeah, that, if, if yeah. you have like-minded people all in the pursuit of a common goal, yeah. Um, it's really binding, right? That's awesome. And, um, you know, and, well, and, and everyone's an owner, like all the employees, you know, have stock options. That's time, great. Right. Yeah. So it, it makes it feel like it's our company and yeah. we're working together to make a world a better place. And let's, let's go. One of the things I really like that, um, well, so I used to work at Deep Local and Nathan Martin uh, runs that. Yeah. And when we were hiring, uh, this would have been like, 2014 so a few years ago now but he said um you know recommend people that you would want to work with and it sounds like you've gone like three steps further and you've attached a formula and a procedure yeah and a whole set of just you know you know you've you've made it quantitative and, and more repeatable and, and I mean, that's, right. that's an incredible accomplishment yeah so you know because a company is its people yeah the spot Agreed. line that's it Right, you know, and uh, so work and life is short, so work with the people you want to work with. Oh yeah, I mean, you spend most of your waking hours at work, right? And yeah, so that's that's kind of been my philosophy too. Is yeah, I want to work on engaging projects that are making the world better in my mind. And I also want to work with amazing people that are yep. challenging me intellectually, teaching me new things, and and performing, you know, at a higher standard. Yes, totally agree. That's nice. Awesome. I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah, let's end it there. Awesome. All right, I appreciate it. Thank Morgan, you. Thanks for coming in. All right, thank you. Yeah. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening, and please come to the next one.